Kaywick by Vincent Verga. Publisher, Allison Books, Los Angeles, New York. Narrator, Eric Ost. Chapter 9. The morning after the birthday party, I was torn from restless sleep by wailing outside my windows. The voices sharp and violent merged with my dream of a funeral. There were a field full of people mourned aloud, swaying like tall weeds in a fierce wind. When I pulled the drapes open, a flock of enormous, long-winged gray and white birds was revealed, wheeling and diving and circling overhead. I had seen these birds from the ferry crossing to Manhattan Island. It was their keening that sounded in my ears. I stepped out onto the portico to get a closer look. Several, perching on the balustrade, calmly turned their mottled brown heads askew to examine me. In the garden below, I don't know, Gaylord was the still center of the birds. Activity, wrapped in a white robe, he stood, feeding the squalling tribe, all the while chanting to them, his baritone voice rising and falling amidst their calls. Robert, good morning. Come help me feed them. What are they called? Gulls. Seagulls. Only a visit from the port. What are you feeding them? Bread. They eat everything but lettuce, fruit, and onions. How do you know that? I once had several for pets. Come join me. I dressed quickly and went down to the garden. There were dozens of gulls, the bread we threw to them was still warm. Is is this our breakfast? Bread? Mm, yeah. I used up all the other. I started feeding the bread to myself. How do you feel this gorgeous morning, Robert? Hungry and tired and ashamed. All at once. Ashamed? Why on earth ashamed? I disgraced myself last night. Nonsense! Uh, that's what birthdays are for. But it was your birthday. I hadn't planned to say anything. I thought I'd slip away from them before tea and nap. Until then, I'd hoped to smile a lot and keep my mouth tightly closed. But standing beside him in the morning sunlight, receiving his smiles and the bread from his outstretched hands, watching the wind ruffle his hair and billow the robe he wore, I was overcome with guilt for having violated his nocturnal solitude. My heart pressed inward from the chaotic euphoria. I fastened on the seemingly obvious cause for my uneasiness. I made a fool of myself, Mr. Dino. Nonsense! Anyone who doesn't get kite high on his first encounter with champagne is the fool. Be grateful you have such a small capacity. Uh, let's hear no more about it. I began to thank him and careen into a lengthy speech about him always having to forgive me. When Denver's appeared, sparing us both, he had some white garments thrown over his arm. Stop feeding those goddamn birds, you two! He shouted. They'll be coming around every day, again screaming for food. They nearly killed us the last time, bouncing their whelks and bullocks off our heads and smashing them into our teacups. They're visiting Mr. Tonneau. Yes, I can see they're calling cards all over the lawn and on the hem of his captain. Tell them to go home now, Tonneau, please. It's time for our breakfast. What a dreadful day. Brian's in a state. His bread's disappeared. Oh, oh God. Dino, you haven't given those monogamous aviary horrors our bread. How could you? Is that the thanks I get for ferreting out these shirts of yours? Uh, where's Kale? Kale is busy hiding in the library, pretending to be asleep. Kale, come out here and eat these gulls here. Uh, Robert, uh, these tunics are for you. If he wants them. Uh, want them? <laughs> yes, please, I want them. They're wonderful. He handed me the belted shirts. Four, all white with extraordinary embroidery on the fronts. One design in blue, one maroon, and two white on white. Uh, Denver's thought they'd suit you, Robert. Uh, thank you, Denver's. Uh, what would one do without you? 
I'm sure I can't imagine. I asked to be excused and ran to my room to put on one of the new shirts. They were the softest fabric and featured only two buttons on the right shoulder. I chose the maroon embroidery with its entwined wild flowers and butterflies. A perfect fit, Denver exclaimed, as I took my place at table on the patio. What good luck! I'm pleased something is going right this morning. You quite resemble a Russian aristocrat, a Georgian, I'd say. Wouldn't you, Denver? What's Georgian? asked Keyes, as he appeared around the hawthorn hedge. Certainly not our morning visitors. I'd know their young, healthy American voices anywhere. Once heard, never forgotten. I thought I was in a Roman piazza. Why are you rudely gaping at me, dears? For to know I'm always down to breakfast. He took his seat and only then noticed my new shirt. Goodness, where did you find that? Before anyone replied, Brian walked through the door, carrying fresh rolls. He looked preoccupied until he saw my shirt. And then he started as though pinched, dropped the silver plate, groaned, and dashed back into the house. What's wrong? I pleaded, flabbergasted. It's Cormac's shirt, and Keith started to explain. When Deneau annoyed, interrupted. That's absurd. Nothing is Cormac's anymore. They are my shirts, and I want Robbie to have them. Startled, I looked at him. He had never called me Robbie before. My family always called me Robbie. How would he know that? A feeling of intimacy pierced me as though he'd gently stroked my face or kissed me on the forehead. It's hunky dory with me, dear, Keys continued, unruffled. But please explain that to Brian. He's probably hiding in the still room among the pickles and the fruitcake. Would you prefer me to go, Dunno? The shirts were my idea. Uh, no, thank you, Denvers. I'll go and try to put an end to this nonsense once and for all. Well, hurry back, dear, before the eggs congeal. Dunno exited. We remaining three sat in silence. Denvers frequently glanced upward, nervously expecting something unpleasant to drop into our midst. Do you remember, he began, but Keyes, sighing, interrupted. Denvers, be a dear. Retrieve those rolls from the ground and pass me one before those feathered vertebrates convene a raiding party. Isn't there some Mediterranean adage connecting dropping breads with ill fortune? More than likely, Keyes, more than likely. What a heinous morn. <clears throat> it was quite a while before Deneau returned. When he did, he assured me, us, quietly, that all had been sorted out. No one questioned him. No one seemed surprised or relieved that he should take care of everything. It seemed the natural order of things. I blindly followed their lead. After breakfast, he invited me to go horseback riding. The horses were stabled on the far side of the cottage. As we passed the deserted house, I told him how much it attracted me. He offered to take me through it after lunch, and then to take me boating on the pond. We rode the horses westward along the beach while farm workers collected seaweed to fertilize the fields. It always saddens me to see that, he said. It's proof that summer is over. We rode in and out of the surf, passing the main house, the jetty, and beyond the white oaks the bathhouse where the steam yacht and sailboats were secured. He talked of summer outings to his neighbors, the gardeners who lived on an island in the bay and even projected a trip for the following spring to his own island, Key Gaylord, off the coast of Florida. I was content riding beside him, listening to him, happily planning our lives. Could we reach the New York Ferry by riding along this shore? Yes, with a little help from a bridge or two, if we were riding towards Sterling Harbor. Now, uh, we would reach the end of the island before lunch. Life is wonderful, I said, musing aloud. When it is pure and whole, yes. And uh, when is it not whole? 
and it's shattered beyond repair. It's never beyond repair. Oh, you're very young. So are you, I thought. No, oh, I said. I glanced at his face. He was staring straight ahead. We rode in complete silence. I found great solace in his comradeship. I mean, he said, you're very innocent. As you are, I whispered. He snorted, cantering ahead. I caught up with him, and then hurried by at a fast trot. I had never ridden for pleasure before. Galloping along the sea's edge magnified the sense of exhilaration and freedom. When the breeze quickened, turning the caped waves once upon another, fleeing the spray into our pass, we gambled back toward the stable, pausing at the cove just behind the cottage to watch the osprey feed. He took as much delight in their skills as I. He called them by another name, uh, Fishhawk, and told me that, unlike the gulls, they could never be tamed. Uh, they won't trust and always keep their distance. They're quite weary of humans. As you were, I thought, and as I was, eager to explore the cottage, I hurried us through lunch. There was something about the place that intrigued me. The romantic connotations of large empty houses with a prevailing aura of sadness over lost opportunities. But since no lives had been shared there, it seemed to glow with possibilities of promises yet to be exchanged. When I attempted to explain to the others, they grew perplexed, and I fell silent until apples and cheddar were served for dessert. No pastry from Brian or Monsieur Henry? Don't be disconsolate, dear. There are worse fates than apples and cheddar. Deneau laughed. Denver's consoled. Mr. Henry is sound asleep. He adhors the country and has difficulty sleeping at night. The quiet unnerves him. Mr. O'Shea does breakfast and lunch for us. Brian has vanished. Vanished? Yes, but not to worry. It happens now and again. I wish to pursue the subject, but I noticed a flush suffused in O's face. I suggested we pocket the apples and leave for the cottage. Uh, don't get too dirty, boys, Denver's called after us. Oh, the place hasn't been cleaned in years. From the moment Deneau unlocked the front door, I wanted to live there. I hadn't seen any of it. But I knew the oak door was built to human scale, my human scale, and the lock sounded softly, echoing inward, announcing our arrival. This was a house that could easily become a home, I thought as I crossed the small foyer to look up the curving wooden staircase. Who was the last person to live here? I was. You were? Uh, when did you live here? <laughs> Before I left for Paris. I thought you left for Paris immediately, uh, after? No, not immediately. I lived here before the fire, too. Uh, there is so much I must learn about you, I thought, frowning. He moved into the room in the fright of the foyer. I followed white sheets covering everything. The library, he said, raising both arms. This way, to the dining room, please. <laughs> oh, I moaned. Something tells me this is going to be very quick. Quick, but exemplary. The tiles in this foyer are from Liverpool. The chandelier is Waterford. Uh, notice in wainscoting. Uh, please, oak. He slid open the double doors to the left of the foyer, crossed the music room, and disappeared into the dining room. I did not follow. I stood gazing out the windows at the pond and the towering trees at its far end. The four swans looked carved from alabaster. Early afternoon light warmed every corner of the room. We await your presence in the dining room, Master White. I went toward him, but stopped in the doorway. The elm tree, ancient and massive, grew directly outside. It filled the window. I told him I would live in the house just to be near the tree. It's a witch elm. Very special and rare in this part of the world. 
The Indians revered it. There are legends attached to that tree. No one knows how my grandfather convinced the Indians to leave their sacred elm. When I was a child, they camped during each solstice praying to lift the curse. No happiness here until the blind shall see, I recited respectfully. Oh, we Gaylords are a doomed race. Our history bears it out. Uh, perhaps you were, but are no longer. Perhaps... The prophecy's been played out, I offered, thinking it. If not, I will end it. A fate is mine's disastrous, he smiled. Love is, I said boldly. Love works miracles. That kind of love exists only in novels. Art imitates life. Don't confuse the two. Let's go upstairs. The room above took advantage of the tree's breadth. A narrow balcony thrust us into its center. If I lived here, Mr. Deneau, this would be my bedroom. I'd wake in the morning to the sound of leaves and in the fall watch them defoliate. You look shocked. Do I sound mad? When I lived here, this room was my bedroom. Everyone thought me mad. Great minds, etc., I said. Great hearts. Ditto, I thought. The third floor he had used as his study. Then you keep servants with you. No, I cooked and kept house for myself. And your brother? He'd visit. This was your uh, Walden? I often thought that. I wanted to go into the attic above to view the tree from overhead, but he nervously cautioned it was unsafe. If you're with me, Mr. Deneau, what danger is there? I'm touched by your faith, Robbie, but it's structurally unsound. Uh, someone may want to live in here someday, I paused and added. For instance, me. We librarians require a certain solitude, you know, stealing from the farm. A Whitman could write poems here forever, undetected. What would have happened had we walked up those attic stairs then? Could it have been that simple? While he was locking the door to deter vagabonds, I remembered the art room and asked for a key. Why? I want to work with the art books. Oh, don't, don't worry about them. But I'd like to see the Turner watercolors and the butterflies and your stories. We'll do that tomorrow. No one's been in there for years. I lock it to prevent the staff from damaging anything. Oh, oh, I mumbled, annoyed by his not having checked his story with Denver's. Why was he so protective toward Keys? He led me behind the cottage along a curving path to a tool shed concealed by overhanging foliage. Inside were gardening implements, and to the rear folded yellow canvas tents. Large striped umbrellas, wooden tables and chairs, cushions, pillows, inflatable toys, and, and several peculiarly shaped boats and floats. And what's that mean? It's at home? I asked, mimicking keys. It's a raft. Yes, but what's it supposed to be? A peanut butter sandwich, he answered quietly, verging on discomfort. It was meaningful at the time. My father dabbled heavily in whimsy. I laughed, honestly delighted. I think it's delicious, he moaned and relaxed. Laughing along with me, he had so many sensitive areas. I hoped I would always find them so easily detectable. We dislodged a small, round wooden craft at had to be emptied at pails, balls, shovels, sand molds, and various other children's toys. What a bizarre-looking boat. It looks like a walnut shell. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. The other half is in here, somewhere. Uh, Cormac and I each had half a shell. We grew up confusing the world with this boat. Whimsy can be a dangerous thing. It's a lovely little boat. I'd forgotten all about it. 
We carried the boat effortlessly and eased it into the water. The swans swam over to investigate. Dragonflies darted and hung suspended. A yellow flag iris swayed. Marsh marigolds bobbed, and the ripples disturbed the pickerel weeds and the myriad water lilies. He stepped in first, then helped me aboard. Under the ribs, we located and detached the small paddles. I feel enchanted floating in this thing. Uh, what's it made of? Walnut. Why, did I ask? Okay, if this makes you feel enchanted, we must have a float in the halved watermelon. I laughed loudly and spontaneously clapped my hands together. There's a rowboat for the entire family decorated in the form of half a melon, with its alternate slices removed. The hole is bright green and one sits on the remaining pink sections on oval black cushions that look like seeds. It was Nanny Wells' favorite silly. It would make her laugh as nothing else could. I used to love to ride in it with her. He fell silent and stopped rowing, lifting the dripping oars out of the water. We drifted near the still center of the tiny lake. A skein of geese in migratory formation flew overhead. To my left, I spotted Brian emerging from the trees at the far edge of the water. I waved to him. He did not respond. When Dano waved, calling a greeting, he stopped walking. After a long pause, reluctantly, he lifted his right arm before disappearing in the direction of the beach. He's going to the mud flats. What for? After the tide leaves, it's great fun to flop and slide in the primordial ooze, as Cormac called it. It's a good place to be alone in the summer. There's a forest of sunflowers along one side. Some of them grow to over six feet in height. One can vanish safely and comfortably among them. I looked over after Brian. A kale sat on the bank, watching us. Mr. Deneau, I began cautiously, was Carmack responsible for Brian's accident? He began rowing again. I trailed my hand in the water, touching the water lilies as we moved by them. I was sorry I hadn't waited to ask Denver's, but... There was something about the mood in the boat, the rapport between the two of us, that told me the question was acceptable at that moment. What makes you think that? Uh, the way he reacted to the shirt this morning. One need not be Holmes to deduce. It was thoughtless of me to have allowed Denvers to give you that shirt. He stopped rowing. We drifted again this time toward the shore. It suddenly brought my brother's presence back into the house. Is that so terrible? The night we met, you asked me if my dreams are disturbed by him. Yes, they are. He's been dead 13 years, and I'm not the only one still haunted by him. He was cursed with a violent temper, which he never controlled. That's not fair. I shouldn't say that. He tried. He just didn't succeed very often. Everyone has suffered because of it. He was in a horrible boating accident with Brian. The boy hasn't spoken a clear word since. Denver's is cruelly maimed. Keys is a broken man. A Cormac left us empty creatures. It's as if we, too, are made of walnut. The boat reached the shore. We disembarked. As we approached the house, Teo ran to meet us. He handed to know a message. I was remarking how pleased I was to see him again when a gasp from our mutual employer interrupted the exchange. What is it? I asked. An employee of mine has been brutally murdered. Uh, Teo, pack my bags. We'll be leaving tonight. Uh, send Joshua to the test table. We'll need a carriage. I'll wire for the train immediately. We'll have to send uh, Lonnie and Mr. O'Shea. Uh, excuse me, Robert. I have a great deal to do before I can leave. Uh, Teo, tell Henry I'll take tea upstairs. With that order, he walked quickly toward the house, pausing to search his vest pockets. He turned and threw some keys to Teo. Uh, for the cases, he called over his shoulder, disappearing through the open library windows, sending the keys, change, hands. It reminded me of the locked art room 
When I ran after him, catching him in the foyer, he bade me follow. In his room, from the center drawer of his desk, he produced a large ring of keys. He detached one and handed it to me. Oh, the watercolors are in the large cabinet behind the door. And take the entire Turner portfolio in the top tray. Take the Girton portfolio too, uh, the Panorama series. They're worth study. And take the Cotman and the Varnes and the Sandbees. I'd love to go through them with you, but I can't. Never mind. Uh, next time, uh, take whatever you want. They're all in the cabinet with the narrow drawers behind the door. The telegraph machine on the desk began clicking, printing a message on a strip of paper and unwound from a roll somewhere within. I turned to leave. M. Henry nearly trampled me into the carpet. He was enraged that his special birthday tea was not being treated with the proper respect. Business. Always business. Why not business afterward? And then Denver's appeared, pale and shaking. Is it true about Jones? Trailed by keys and tears. So soon, dear. Why so soon? Joshua ran in to report the horses ready. Lonnie, cape in hand, inquired whether Mr. O'Shea was required that evening. Ambrose stood in the doorway to announce the hour for tea arrived and asked whether or not Mr. Lucen and his son were to receive instructions for the roses or were they to spend the night in the sunroom, leering and snickering over the filthy fawn? Calmly, Mr. Deneau answered each question. Yes, he would go down to tea. Yes, Jones was dead. Murdered? Yes, strangled and dumped in the East River. Yes, he was leaving too soon, but would return for Thanksgiving. Perhaps. Good. Uh, Joshua, thank you. Uh, Ten o'clock will be fine. Uh, yes, Mr. O'Shea would be needed that very evening. Denver's was asked to have Mr. Grouse take care of the Lewisons. Come, Robert. Let's go down to tea. My head was revolving. Who were all these people? Why had I never seen or heard of them before? When I met Mr. Harrington and his son in the stable that morning, I was not surprised, but then I'd assumed someone was caring for Frenchy and the other horses. Uh, they're the staff, Robert. Uh, do you think Gaywick runs itself? I shook my head. Of course not. I knew large houses had servants. I was forever reading articles in magazines about the shortage of good ones. I'd read shelves of novels where their importance was made quite clear. I simply had not seen them doing whatever it was they did. There are a dozen people down below stairs every day. If you should happen across one working somewhere in the house, all you have to do is smile. They won't hurt you. I'm sure they won't. It's just strange. I haven't seen one of them. Not really, Robert. You haven't seen them because they haven't wanted you to. They are trained to be invisible. If it weren't for them and for Denver's management, a gay wook would be uninhabitable. A tea was an elaborate affair. A field of flowers decorated the patio. A lionese lace tablecloth under the china and silver and crystal signaled the event. We drank a dry white wine. M. Henry did not approve tea. And sang another round of happy birthday. None of us was very talkative. Keys sniffed discreetly. When Deneau left, we three remained at table. Denver's, I asked. Who was Jones? A business associate, Robert. Were they very close? No. They were close enough, dear. Not as close as Abel in the late cane, but close enough. Shut up, Keith. You are worse than an old fishwife. He had a widow before wife. If you don't keep still, I'll wedge a pie where your brains ought to be. We finished our tea in silence. Uh, the lock on the art room door stuck, and I had to fidget with it before the lock sounded, and the door opened. The air inside was heavy. Cobwebs clustered in corners against the wall. To my right stood a great roll-top desk, exactly like the one owned by my father. It 
like his must have been assembled in the room because it could never have been maneuvered through the doorway or the narrow windows. I was amazed to see the desk. I had tremendous affection for the one in my father's study and had always naively believed it one of a kind. Seeing its twin here in this room surprised me. Behind the door was the file, a large wooden bureau with a dozen wide, shallow drawers, each, but the bottom drawer was neatly labeled, each, but the bottom drawer was unlocked. Why had someone locked it? What could be more important than the Rembrandt etchings stored in the unlocked drawer above it? As if by reflex, I crossed to the familiar roll-top desk. It rattled open, revealing an identical arrangement of little knobbed drawers that concealed, no doubt, secret places similar to the ones I'd uncovered one spring morning long ago. I found the key to the file's bottom drawer. I knew immediately in which tiny niche it was secreted. Instead of returning to the cabinet, I knelt in front of the desk and, out of curiosity, slid open the concealed panel in its right side. It contained two books, each bound in black calf and wrapped once around with a leather thong. I undid the top knot. Bold black letters leaped from the page. Private! The word was printed in a child's hand. I turned to the second page. Being his private book, Dunno Gaylord. I hesitated before turning to the third page. On your honor, it is still not too late. I turned another page, my heart pounding as I read. Cormac, if you read this, I will kill you. I closed the book. It was a child's hand. How old was he when he started his diary? I opened it to check the date on the first entry. 4 July, 1877. He was seven years old. I read the first entry. See still switching rings. They are stupid not to see. I would tell, but see would kill me. I will tell it here, and I will feel better like last week in confession. I closed the book, picking up the second volume. I undid the thong and opened it at random. 9 November, 1884. C visiting D. At least he's leaving me alone. I'm ashamed because I'm jealous and I miss him. Jealous of who? Of both. I hate them. Of both. D. Calling C by my name, he says he will per punish it. D. It scares me. I don't know what to do. The two lines from a poem in Latin followed. Catalyst, I translated. I hate and love. Ask how. I cannot tell, but I feel it, and I am torn in two. I've licked the pages forward. 18th of July, 1885. I tried to drown myself last night, but afraid I swam ashore. I will do it yet, and soon. I should hang myself from the Walsh elm. But why do such a thing to my tree? Fade far away, dissolve, and quiet forget What thou among the leaves hast never known The weariness, the fever, and the fret Here where men sit and hear each other's groan I flick backward, 3rd of November, 1882 Last night, see let me be father I liked it as much as being S we agreed to take turns being father. I flicked backward to 5 May. C. Got a hole in the drapes. He was telling the truth. I closed the second book and sat on the floor in front of the desk. If I studied the diaries, I would learn everything I wanted to know about Dono Gaylord. I would also learn the truth about Cormac and what had transpired at Gaywick. But I had no right to read his books. Would I want anyone to read my journals? The mere thought of anyone, anyone, reading my words, invading my privacy to that extent, made me feel queasy and lighthearted. Carefully, I retied the two books and returned them to their hiding place. 
I did the same with the key. I took the watercolors he had suggested and went to his room to return the art room key. His door was locked. He did not answer my knock. I returned to my room. It was a brisk evening. Someone had lit a fire for me. I spread the watercolors on the carpet and immediately realized a book was needed. If I were to fully understand what lay before me. Hastening back to the art room, pleased the key had not been returned, I found exactly what I wanted with no difficulty. I also found a loose page sketchbook entitled Copies. It was a record of all the paintings at Gaywick, each in pen and ink with dabs of oil paint denoting the colors and information detailing size, peculiar markings, signatures, stamps, damages, a date of completion, date of purchase, etc. I took it with me. Deneau did not descend for dinner. He did appear for dessert, however. Henry had worked with Brian on an outrageous concoction and had threatened Harry Carey if it were not appreciated. He seemed in good humor, though a bit restrained. Champagne was ordered. Henry and Brian were toasted. Again we sang, Happy Birthday. Some good cheer was generated and immediately dispersed when he said goodbye and left us to wrap up odds and ends. I feel all odds and ends, my dears. I have some more champagne. Ah, sans les nez d'antan, my dears. I couldn't agree more. Give me your glass. I left them when they opened the third bottle. Luggage set on the foyer, landing ready for the carriage. I wanted to head for the art room to see what was locked in the bottom drawer of the watercolor cabinet. Just behind the door instead, I went to my room, feeling virtuous and wrote in my journal. The entries of Deneau Gaylord's books had aroused my imagination. One line I logically followed to its bitter conclusion. He says he will punish D. It scares me. I don't know what to do. I'm going to punish D. Punish Denver's? Punish... No, he couldn't have. Denver's is maimed. He had said that just this afternoon. It simply wasn't possible. I refused to believe anything so ghastly. I put my pen down and once again headed for the art room at a brisk trot. I was willing to violate the sanctity of those two volumes to prove myself wrong. Please, God, I whispered as I hurried up the side stairs. Please, God, don't let me be right. I did not need the key. The door was unlocked. I opened the secret panel on the side of the desk. The books were gone. I checked the hidden drawer, knowing the outcome. The key had been removed. The bottom drawer of the watercolor cabinet was unlocked and empty. On my couch in my room, I tried reading Boswell's Johnson, but could not concentrate. Headless bees buzzed in my brain. Taking a collection of Keats from Library One, I walked out into the garden, suddenly beckoned by the sea. Keys grieved through the moonlight sonata. Once at the beach, I knew why I'd come. On the edge of the jetty, my sea-soaked, glistening angel of light. My Deneau was poised at the moment of plummeting in my heart. Pandemonium reamed as he soared and fell to the moon in flamed waves. Back in my room with Kale on my lap, I opened the book of Gaylord paintings. They were in alphabetical order. The Rossetti portrait induced a palpable sense that any moment the stars would fall and crush me to dust. It was the image of my mother. I hugged Kale. Love is my strength. Love is my only defense. I whispered blindly. Love was my greatest enemy. A gay Mysteries Audiobooks. I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold. To offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time, being true to their values.